Welcome to today's SITREP and welcome to the United States Navy Memorial. Thank you very much for joining us today. As you know, the mission here at the Navy Memorial is to honor, recognize, and celebrate the men and women of the sea services, past, present, and future, and to inform the public about their service. Today's event is all about that fourth verb, inform. Today's live, interactive, online event is available to naval enthusiasts around the country. And as you can see on your computer, you can ask questions. And I have an iPad sitting here next to me, and I'll be checking out for questions throughout the event uh, to ask our guest. We're honored today to be joined by the, the, Navy's chief, the Chief of Navy Reserves, Vice Admiral John Muston. Before I introduce Admiral Muston, I would like to thank our sponsor, Navy Mutual Aid. We literally could not do what we do without support of companies like Navy Mutual Aid, who provides life insurance uh, to active duty and retired uh, former uh, Navy Sea Service uh, people, as well as anybody who served in the military. So let's, uh, let's now take the, the opportunity to invite Admiral, uh, introduce Admiral Mustin. Uh, it's my honor to introduce somebody I've known for quite a, quite a long time, an active duty officer uh, for 10 or 11 years, served on a destroyer cruiser. I think that's where, I, where you and I first crossed paths, and then uh, transitioned into the reserves, went up through the ranks at numerous operational uh, challenging billets, uh, both here in Washington, as well as uh, significant operational billets out with the fleet. Um, including uh, Commander Expeditionary Strike Group 2. Uh, so Admiral Mustin, it's, it's my great honor to, uh, to welcome you to the National Chiefs Mess and the Navy Memorial. It's, it's friend, fantastic to be here, Frank. Thanks for the invitation. So let's, uh, let's jump right into it, Admiral Mustin. Um, today's environment, uh, as challenging as ever, arguably more challenging than when you and I uh, met, when you and I first came in with China as a looming threat. Uh, this is a big week for you as a milestone with the Navy Reserves. But it's also a, a very important time. Can you start off with just a, a status of the of the reserve force and give us a little update? Absolutely, yeah, I would love to. So thanks for setting the stage for what's going on from a geopolitical context, but also just as a quick data point for folks, when you say it's a, a milestone date for us, uh, Friday is our 108th birthday or our 108th anniversary. So um, in addition to condemning my force master chief and I to lighting a lot of candles, uh, I would tell you, we're very proud of the heritage that has resulted over more than a century of reserve so service. You know, the, the Navy Reserve was born uh, prior to the U.S. entry into World War I. And since then, in every major conflict the nation has contributed or has uh, participated in, the Navy Reserve has contributed, even up to the point where in World War II, we had over two million reserve sailors. So, so that's indicative of the way both that we are built and integrated into our fighting force. Now, back to your question, though, about what's going on with the complexity that we see in the geopolitical environment, there is no question that we are undergoing a transformation. And that is not just a Navy Reserve transformation, but it's our part of the transformation that is underway in all of the Department of Defense. It really started in 2017 with the release of the National Security Strategy and was followed in 2018 by Secretary, former General Mattis's National Defense Strategy, which for the first time called out the transition from the prior two decades of the global war on terror to what we refer to now as great power competition or this uh, this enduring strategic competition era. So what does that mean to me and our Navy Reserve? It means that we have got to design our force and train it and be prepared to deliver, to generate forces that are relevant for a fight today and the future, not necessarily the fight that we fought yesterday. And so because we had focused so exclusively on land-based and really non-maritime conflicts from the reserve contribution, it meant that we had some tectonic changes to make. And so I'll get into it in more detail uh, in yeah. a few minutes, but, but there's a lot going on. And we recognize, frankly, that the, the decisions we're making and the changes we're making today are gonna impact not only the next five, 10, and 20 years, but really is gonna impact the balance of the century. So, so I view this with great urgency, but also the need for great precision, because it, this is a pretty unforgiving business and we gotta get this right. So through the transitions, uh, of the, what the Navy Reserves have provided uh, through history as well as through your and my time in the military, um, readiness seems to be, you know, uh, always the challenge, the, the readiness, and quite frankly, readiness across the fleet. We find ourselves talking about readiness a lot on SITREP here. Um, how, do, how do you tackle warfighting readiness with the reserves and, and, and what's the status of yeah, that? Yeah, great, great question. Thanks for teeing that one up because I would tell you that there are so many separate initiatives and, um, and, and efforts underway right now. 
literally we were tracking about 162 things that we said we've got to get after immediately. These are things that are policy, procedure, administration, systems, the way that we do what we do. So we knew that we had to change some things with urgency. But the reason and the, and the way that I tie it together for my force to add some clarity to what we're doing is we generate a product and that product is warfighting readiness. You know, we've got 60,000 sailors that we are bringing to bear in, in the needs that, that are defined by the Navy, the Marine Corps and the Joint Force. And so I've got to find a way to ensure that we're delivering readiness where it's needed most and we can deliver it when it's needed most. So as it relates to war, what is warfighting readiness for the reserve force, that is our single North Star. I mean, that is, that is my rallying cry to help folks understand how to prioritize their precious cycles. We need to be doing the things that contribute to our ability to mobilize to a billet and be trained and certified to perform in that billet on day one. And so, and I'm sorry to go on too long on this one, but, yeah. but there's two components for this. So for every reserve sailor, we talk about mobilization readiness. And, and that is obviously a very important part of the readiness that we're tracking, but, but that's a necessary but insufficient piece of the readiness that we generate. You gotta be ready to go when we ask you, clearly. But you also have to be trained and ready to perform in your mobilization billet when we ask you. So I look at both mobilization readiness and then as I refer to it, mission readiness. And then the product of those two things is the holy grail, which is warfighting readiness. So this explains why you issued Navy Reserve fighting instructions Absolutely. back when you first uh, took yeah. over as Chief of Navy yeah. Reserves. Talk to us about that document. Talk to us how that's progressed over your tour. Well, yeah. So like any new uh, leader, you know, I took about uh, 90 to 100 days and said, I want to I want to listen. I want to kind of ask more questions than I direct at the time. But then I wanted to let folks know where my head was and what were my priorities. And as I started taking stock of the things that I had been tracking both during the tenure of my predecessor, Vice Admiral Luke McCollum, but also the things that I had been wishing at some point, hey, if I were ever in charge, these are things mm -hmm. that I'm gonna get after. Mm -hmm. So as we started mapping them out with my staff, it, it wasn't easy to say, hey, there's 100 things to do or 160 things to do. I said, they naturally cluster in a couple of different areas and we ascribed a line of effort for each of them. So we refer to them as design the force, train the force, and mobilize the force. So a lot of initiatives were associated with how do we create, how do we design our force? How do we assess its uh, relevance, its readiness? How do we train our sailors? How do we mobilize our sailors? Each of which is uh, a thesis in its own right. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but when I thought about how I wanted to get this out to the force, lots of ways, you obviously are an expert in strategic communications. I said, I wanna issue it as an executive order, an exord because I wanted to reinstitute the militarization of what we do. I wanted to send a signal that said, this is not your grandfather's reserve force. We are a critical warfighting contributor to what the Navy is expecting in this great power competition era. And frankly, I wanted it to be a little bit of a wake up call to the team. So I selected a name that was evocative to uh, a second fleet directive from the late eighties. And I knew that some of the older folks would get that connection. Some of the younger folks probably didn't, but the key was I wanted to shift our focus to war fighting and it was about fighting. And, um, and the reality was it tied it up with a bow pretty neatly. And I would say that it was not a strategy document as much as an executive order that said, these are things that we have to do now. And that was in 2020. And then I had some runtime with it where we really, we knocked out, kind of knocked down targets on a number of things that were very urgent to us. And about 18 months later, I updated it with what we call the Navy Reserve Fighting Instructions 2022 into which I added a fourth line of effort, which was something that I realized was a little bit of a miss. Those first three, design, train, and mobilize the force, clearly focus on our warfighting uh, capabilities and capacity and our ability to generate forces and deliver them. But I left out something that was pretty important that, um, that I wanted to make right, which was develop the force. And that was really, mm -hmm. that's the sailor focus line of effort so that we can make sure that we're developing the right culture, that we are providing the right environment so our sailors can succeed regardless of where they come from. I wanna harvest all of the great diversity of thinking and talent and backgrounds that we have in our team. So, so we've added this. And by the way, each of those lines of effort is led by one of my two stars. So we have an 08 action officer that's leading them. And, uh, and I get a quarterly update on it. They get a monthly update on it. And we, I keep my finger uh, very tightly on the pulse of how we're doing because again, these are actions. These are things that we gotta get after immediately with urgency. 
So I think we could spend a couple hours yeah. talking about those. Um, and let me just let me zero in on a, on a couple. Um, uh, we talked about China. We talk about the, the long term uh, strategic competition that we're in. Um, how do how do you evolve your training into being in an environment that you yeah. can train to that current force? This is not a short term effort. Right. You know, how do you right. do that? Yeah. Well, the first thing we had to do was take stock of where are we today? You know, if we snap a chalk line and say, how ready are we as it relates to our training? Without telling uh, stories out of school, I would say we did not have a, a consistent uh, strategic institutional reference point for us to say, okay, I'm 80% ready. Mm -hmm. So one of the major initiatives of that line of effort was to develop the systems that allowed us to look at either a dashboard or a single consistent mechanism across all of our units. At the time I took over, we had 1,400 units. You know, and I said, and, and the majority of all that training readiness was typically on a C drive with a, a well-intentioned cell res sailor. You know? mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so anyway, but now we're investing in the systems that allow us to have aggregated data availability online. We need to recognize it's 2023. We have systems at our disposal that allow us to capture and enter data. And we need to get out of the legacy mindset of saying we're going to etch things on stone tablets and fly in with carrier pigeons. You know, we need to leverage the technology that's available to us. So, so we're looking not only at how we do what we do, you know, fr frankly, it's why we do what we do, how we do what we do, and to what end state. You know, it's not enough for us to pat ourselves on the back with a lot of activity. We need to be working on things that generate a change in, in what we deliver. So back to training. I can't tell you today, but we're getting pretty darn close. I, could, I want to be able to tell the CNO and the Secretary of the Navy and each of our four-star fleet commanders, hey, as far as training goes, the reserve force writ large is 86% ready to go. And, and that allows me also to focus my efforts on, hey, what's the holdup in the other 14%? Is there something that's institutional or systemic? Should I focus there? Or, you know, are there things that we're doing really well that we want to leverage and apply elsewhere? So, so anyway, it's, um, it's a workflow issue. It's a technology issue. It's a training internal issue, but, uh, but lots going on there too. So I have to tell you, so it, it, it's almost, you're bringing back some hard thoughts of uh, being at, uh, at BUPERS and the, tech, right. and the challenge of technology uh, to be able to master, uh, to, your, to your point about training or personnel in general. I mean, yeah. and then we also rem all remember the individual augmentee and in, in, uh, time frame and the, the challenge of putting the right person at the right place at the right time yeah. uh, and a and, uh, little bit of upheaval that was, caught, that was caused, quite frankly, across all the military, the country of after 9-11 and, and yeah. the reserves phenomenal response as, yeah. as IAs when the Navy reserves really stepped, stepped forward. Um, how are you evolving now, uh, post, I think we're post IA time. Sure. Um, how are you evolving now with the 58,000 reservists uh, in order to be able to best support the Navy? Another great comment and question. So, so the, the nature of IA certainly has changed. I mean, just as a data point for everyone, I mean, we as a Navy Reserve have provided over 100,000 mobilizations since 9-11. I mean, just let that settle in. I mean, that's wait, a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand mobilizations. So yeah. 20, 20 some years. Exactly. So, wow. so, and and the numbers though are are not linear. So it's it's yeah, not sure. It's not uh, five thousand sure. per year. Sure. You know, uh, and certainly there was a spike shortly after nine eleven. But even as recently as a little over a decade ago, we still had ten thousand. What we've seen now is we had normalized and stabilized so that the reserve contribution for about the last six years, not counting uh, 2022, averaged about uh, 2,500 to 3,000. The CNO and the SECNAV recognized that there really was um, a detrimental impact on the reserve force readiness because uh, I think you're probably familiar with the notion of dwell. For every sailor yeah. that we send out, we've got a number of years that we can't uh, mobilize them absent a Secretary of Defense waiver. So, uh, so in conversation around the OPNAV circuits, you know, I was saying, how do we want to spend the precious potential of this reserve force. You know, I mean, our, our ready reserve force is 100,000 people. When we talk about our selected reserve and tar sailors, that's 60,000 people. And that alone makes us the fifth largest Navy in the world. So I said, if really? we want to spend, you know, the precious potential of our sailors doing IA missions, that's fine. You know, I'll, I'll get on board with that. I really feel that our two missions are both operational support and strategic depth. And, and to define those amorphous terms, Strategic depth is the readiness that we're describing to 
fill billets and roles that are baked into operational plans and concepts of operations, concepts of employment. So, so back to the IA question, the Navy now has been working to reduce the IA burden across the board. And so I work with my partner, the OPNAV N35, Vice Admiral Gene Black. Mm -hmm. I, I work with uh, US Fleet Forces and, and they're in one to say, okay, where do we see commonality of year over year requirements for IAs? And frankly, if we've done it more than two years in a row, it's probably not an IA. That's an enduring requirement. So, so now we have worked to say, we're gonna build units or dedicated people. Instead of IAing them, we're gonna PCS them. You know? so, so it ought to not be plucking someone from a different unit, whether active or reserve. But frankly, we as a service wanna get after minimizing the IA burden. So your question was, you know, are we done with IAs? The short answer is we'll never be done with IAs. There will always be some degree of joint demand from our combatant commanders. And, and for that demand, uh, I am very comfortable saying the reserve force has a share of contribution. The reason being because I feel like our sailors actually get great expertise. They get reps and sets. They get to do what they do based on the construct that we're using now for mobilizations, which we refer to as billet-based activation. You know, we're not going to take aviators and send them to Djibouti to do uh, security force work. You know, yeah. Yeah. we're going to say for sailors who have unique training, certifications, credentials, or are in units that do specific things that map to requirements, then that is a billet-based activation. And again, I, I think that our sailors are knocking down the door to, to fill those billets. I mean, we view mobilizations favorably. This year for FY23, we're seeing about 14% of the total burden. We've got a little less than 1,000 total. So again, the number's dropped. Only 14%. 14% involuntary. So, you know, 86% of our uh, mobilizations are folks who raise their hand and say, hey, I want to go do that. And, and I want to encourage them to continue doing it because they're the ones who are going to come back better trained, better qualified, better ready uh, to perform the mission if we get into a whole of government response. And that's well, what's I would important. think when you use the term billet based, yeah. I mean, that's if I'm in a job and I'm asked to deploy to do that job, that's very different than if I'm in a job and I'm deployed to go do something different. Exactly. To your point about exactly. the aviator and, and oh, security. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so that's that's just a fundamental different. I mean, I think we, we tried to do that as much as right. we could post 9-11, right. but there were times where you had to put a round peg in a square hole. And yeah. and now what you're doing yeah. is with this, with billet-based is, is more focused on not the individual, but the, the skill the set. Role. The role, yeah, job. absolutely. Yeah. And by the way, this is not just reserve. I mean, what we're looking at as a service is, one, how do we continue to reduce the IA burden totally? And then secondly, how do we reduce the triple whammy impact of saying, hey, if I'm at surf pack and I take someone out of my staff to go do something for a combatant commander, you know, that has a, a, a direct impact on my readiness as a staff to perform my mission. So the, the standard chatter is, Hey, it's painful to me because I am not uh, I'm not staffed, billeted, or trained to do these missions for IAs, and that's equally applicable for reserve and for uh, for the active navy. Sense. But that's why the billet-based activation makes a lot of sense for us. Yeah, love that. Yeah. So I have a we have a question here Great. Uh, from the audience, and, and I kind of want to tie it into this uh, yeah. into the billet-based part. Uh, Lieutenant Katie Lindman asks, with decommissioning some of the LCSs, how does that impact the thousand billet LCS surface reserve force? And will they be located, uh, allocated elsewhere? And, and I'd like to take that question and maybe address sure. that. But, but also, to your point about how you're organized, are you still, in, and for our audience across the country, are you still organized such that you've got billets assigned to active units as well as yes. yeah. reserve units that you can yeah. draw on for strategic purposes? A absolutely. So let me get to Katie's question in a second, but just to, ask, uh, to answer your question. So there's really three ways that the reserve force contributes to the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Joint Force. So we have operational units, which are units that train and certify and deploy as an entity or a unit of action. So I think of my uh, VR squadrons, you know, um, mm -hmm. they have detachments that are enduring, you know, right now we've got them in Indo-PACOM, we've got them in UCOM, we've got them in CENTCOM. Um, I think of NECC, you know, our maritime security squadrons, we've got boat units that are on a regular uh, global force maritime or global force movement uh, rotation. So they know when they're gonna deploy. SEAL Team 17 and 18, Special Warfare Task Group 11. Um, I look at my car cargo handling battalions. These are all hardware units that train, certify, and mobilize as a unit of action. So that's a third of our first, a force, so that's 30%. The other 70% are uh, referred to as readiness units, and they provide augmentation to existing units. So if, I, if I'm part of a Navy Reserve unit for Second Fleet, 
I would mobilize two second fleet, whereas a cargo handling battalion would mobilize as a unit, not to a unit. Got it. The third way, though, is the recognition of our civilian skills. So like we see at Task Force 59 now working for mm -hmm. uh, my friend, Vice Admiral Brad Cooper out in uh, uh, Naval Forces Central Command, uh, or Fifth Fleet. We've got some folks that do some pretty spectacular things out of uniform. And we like to tap into that to bring them to, uh, to allow them to bring to bear what they do as civilians. So we've got PhDs in artificial intelligence. We've got C-suite Silicon Valley autonomous com uh, autonomous vehicle companies. Mm -hmm. You know, and these folks are raising their hand, saying, "I would love to go spend a year standing up Task Force 59, which is our unmanned task force." But that's applicable in a hundred other categories where I could make your head spin with some of the raw talent that we bring to bear from the reserve force. So, so that's really the model that I draw from and in how we're providing support. Now back to Katie's question, and actually Katie, before we get into the great question about LCS, I, I'd love to leverage uh, the fact that she asked this to say, hey, we also, this is March 1st, so this is Women's History Month, and, um, and, I, and I wanna give a shout out to a couple of the superstar females in the reserve force. Now, I can't name them all, okay? I wish I could because they're doing great work. You probably could, we just don't have time. Pretty close, yeah. But I tell you, we've got uh, some spectacular flag talent. You know, so I've got uh, Eileen Laubacher, Nancy LaCour, uh, we call her J-Mac, but uh, Jackie McClellan, Paula Dunn, uh, Pam Miller, Kim Walls. These are senior female reserve flag officers that are doing great work for the reserve force. I also wanna call on two of my 06s who, who screened as major commanders in the aviation community. These are training and administration of reserve sailors, so they're active duty sailors on reserve rosters, but uh, Lena Kamen and Paige Fellini are skippers of reserve bases right now. I mean, that's a massive undertaking, a very important job. And then lastly, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Lieutenant Commander Amy Thomas, who's my aide and does a phenomenal job every single day. But look, that's a small tip of the iceberg on the great work around our force. But, um, but anyway, back to Katie. All right, Katie, when we started the Littoral Combat Ship Reserve Enterprise, it was a thousand billets. And that was based primarily on 20 units of 50 people. That has since changed over time. So that was about 2016 and 2017. Today, we really only have about 430 billets that are assigned explicitly to littoral combat ship support. Your question was, are they being distributed elsewhere? And the answer is yes. So now we have stood up DESRON specific maintenance execution teams. So still under the surf pack and surf land umbrella. So they still remain uh, N96, which is our uh, surface warfare director and I'm N095. So they still remain under us but we're redeploying them. And the reason we are is because as you alluded to, while we decommission some of our littoral combat ships, Surfpack and Surfland still have a pretty important mission on the waterfront. So while we have those sailors, we've repurposed them to address the realities of today and tomorrow, as opposed to the realities of yesterday. So great question, but it, it brings to mind the importance of the iterative nature of this design the force line of effort. So I, I don't wanna say every 10 years, we look at what we've got and decide if we need to change it. You know, we need to be more nimble so we can say, hey, this is happening in real time. What's the response for the reserve force to address it? So I have to tell you, Admiral, you, you said about three things in there that I want to <laughs> leverage off of. First of all, I, I want to say something about you bringing up uh, Women History Month and the successful yeah. women in the Navy here at the Navy Memorial. So first of all, you, we walked through the Zumwalt exhibit and, right, right. you know, Zumwalt uh, has a famous quote about saying, hey, this isn't about equality or anything like that. It's about talent. And why wouldn't yeah. we go seek the best talent? And right. Boy, I can tell you, sitting here, you mentioned Admiral LaCour, uh, the regional commander here. We, sure. we have a lot of interface with. She's great. I mean, it, the the it's almost uh, it's almost beyond the time of when you even male, female, right. whatever. We're all right. in this together. Um, but let me let me go back to the first thing you were talking about, Fifth Fleet, and um, somebody you and I both know very well, Kevin Wensing. Sure. Um, is in and and typical Kevin, he's actually in with about five questions. Um, <laughs> But uh, let, me, let me drill one on one that, because uh, you alluded to it with Brad Cooper and Fifth Fleet, and he talks about your role in training naval forces from allied nations um, and, and the, the interaction uh, in the international force that I've seen during my time uh, has been uh, tremendous. Where, where are we now yeah. with, with, with- So it's it? interesting. So I have reached out to my international counterparts. And in fact, we've done staff talks with my UK counterpart. In fact, she'll be back in the States, uh, I believe it's next month to come talk to, uh, with us. And uh, my interest of course was to align and frankly learn from what our partners are doing in the UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand as a starting point. 
But I go to the International Sea Power Symposium also, mm -hmm. and I meet with mm -hmm. my reserve counterparts to talk about what can we do. And, and I want to be really careful when I talk to them, because as I mentioned, you know, our reserve force mm -hmm. is huge compared to most navies. So when I talk to my reserve counterparts from the international um, uh, nations, what I find oftentimes is, a, is they're a little daunted by the scale that we bring to bear. Mm -hmm. My interest, however, is to say, I want to learn from how you do what you do. We're big, but in many cases, I think that we're inefficient. And so I've looked at the UK in particular has a couple of pretty interesting models where sailors can self-select and declare their readiness for a given year. I mean, so we uh, as sailors are empowered by Title 10 mm -hmm. that gives us a weekend a month and two weeks a year as a minimum requirement, it's 38 days. You know, in many cases, we've got sailors that are doing over 200 days of support. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's provided by funding that I have to offer discretionary support. But, you know, I look at 38 days and say, okay, that was designed in 1915. Today, mm. maybe we need more time. You know, that was originally designed to account for the mobilization readiness. Today, we can do mobilization readiness pretty quickly. In fact, I can mobilize 50,000 sailors in 30 days. So, so I don't need 38 days per sailor. What I've told my force is, I think you probably need two visits to the reserve center per year, two drill weekends, and that should get all your admin sorted out. The rest of your time should be dedicated to warfighting readiness, getting trained for the billet that you're filling. So as it relates now to the international navies, we continue to, uh, to spitball with one another. You know, hey, how do you do it? Why do you do it that way? How well does it work? You know, I certainly share what we do, uh, but I am keenly interested in what they do because I think we got some room for improvement. Yeah. I want to drill down a little bit in what you just said, mobilize 50,000 reservists in 30 yeah. days. We're going to take a short break. Um, and so we'll be right back. Uh, stick with us. A lot of questions are coming in. And uh, we'll try to get to a couple more of them, as many as we can here in a second break. Uh, but we'll be right back. The people we serve at Navy Mutual are like family. Navy Mutual is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1879, providing life insurance products, service, and education to members of the military service and their families. We understand them because we have served ourselves. Everything we do every day is about serving our members treat them like we would treat our family. It's all about the member. Welcome back and uh, keep the questions coming. We have a lot. I uh, just uh, took a quick look at them and uh, we'll try to get to as many as we can. First, I want to talk about the, the Battle Orders 2032 and then I want to come back to the, the 50,000 uh, 50, in, in, uh, in 30, 30 yeah. days. I'm still I'm, 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 uh, struck by that. But let's talk about Battle Orders 2032 because that's something okay. that, that is, uh, is significant. And, and I have to tell you, I, I just want to commend you. Uh, Ten years out now, nine years out, twenty thirty. You know, it's easy to put together thirty-year plans. Right. It, right. You know, uh, you put together a ten-year plan. Nine years out now, uh, talk to me about. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. Thanks for teeing that one up too. So, so we talked about the Navy Reserve Fighting Instructions, which again, that was an execute order, and that was a task list. I heard some feedback from people saying, there's so much change underway, I just don't see how it all ties together. You know, are, is this activity for activity's sake? Uh, you know, transformation for transformation's sake. And I thought, what I really need to do is share with everyone the vision that I've got in my head about why we're doing what we're doing and, and describe what the reserve force of the future should look like. And so I picked 2032 because I wrote it in 2022. And, and the idea, as you alluded to, was I didn't want it to be close enough in duration that people could say, well, this will never work because the OPNAV instruction hasn't been signed yet. You know? mm -hmm. And I said, but I don't want it to be a 30-year vision, which you know, is a uh, kind of unicorns and lasers future vision that's, uh, that's not realistic. So this is an intentional bridge 
because we will have a document in the fall that will be tied to the CNO's document called Force 2040. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, but I want to let my reserve force understand why we're doing what we're doing and describe the world as though all the execution and initiatives in the fighting orders are complete. So, so it reflects a little bit of what it can and should look like, assuming we get done the things that we're working on now. And, and frankly, again, it is shaped by the geopolitical environment. Uh, the, you know, the, in, the forward is by CNO who recognizes mm -hmm. the need to say, we are on the right glide slope. We've got to continue with urgency, with a sense of, of absolute um, uh, focus on this kind of North Star on what we're trying to accomplish. So the Battle Orders ties up a lot of loose ends to let people understand what it is we're trying to do. So that is a perfect lead in actually to this 50,000 uh, right. sailors right. In, in, in 30 days. Um, what does that really mean? Yeah. So. One of the things that has always disturbed me about being a reserve officer was a comment I would hear from my active colleagues uh, that say, hey, I love the reserves. They just can't get here in time. You know, not going to be relevant in a fight. If something goes down in Taiwan, it's going to be over fast. And hey, the reserve force just, just can't get there in time. And I always thought to myself, well, really, that's not born in fact. I mean, uh, my reaction typically was you're, you're either misinformed or you're a damn liar. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I thought, well, let's, let's really start looking at how we do what we do. So that third line of effort in the fighting instructions is mobilize the force. And we looked at our historical capability, which was about 3,000 a year. And we said the way we did it was very centralized. We sent everybody to Norfolk. We uh, transitioned their status from reserve to active. There's pay account changes. There was some administration associated with what we needed them to sign up for and how we got medical benefits transferred. And then we would often send them to Fort Jackson or we'd issue their Kevlar and their kit and then we'd send them downrange. We know that is not gonna work for us in the future. Again, a future fight is not going to be enabled by trying to get 50,000 folks, which is really the, the size of the selected reserve population. Mm -hmm. There aren't enough flights. The reserve, right. uh, I'm sorry, the airport's the size of this room here, you know. Yeah. So it would be impossible to do that. So we created, via this line of effort, a number of different approaches and activities and even units to say, we call it distributed activation and distributed mobilization. You know, I said at the time, I had 123 reserve centers. Where's their skin in the game when it comes to mobilizing selected reserves? I mean, we've got sailors in every state and territory, almost every zip code in this country. Why would I send them to Norfolk? You know, especially if their ultimate duty station is Pac Norwest or San Diego or Hawaii. The vision as articulated in the battle orders and certainly in the fighting instructions is, I want our sailors to be activated from the reserve center or the NRA, the Navy Reserve activity closest to them. And I want our operational units, that one third of our force, to have organic mobilization capabilities so they can mob themselves and get down range. You know, time is of the essence. And I always say the clock is ticking on this stuff. We, we don't have time to say, well, it'll take us six months, you know, because we've been averaging, hey, 3,000 a year, you can do some back of napkin calculations. I said, that's about a couple hundred a month. I need 15 times the throughput in one twelfth the time. The only way to do that was to leverage our reserve forces command, our readiness commands, our S4 commands, our S5 reserve centers, and all of our operational units to get them to understand how to mobilize, how to demobilize, how to distribute the sailors to get them where they need. So, so anyway, so we took a very centralized process and we decentralized it. We shared ownership. All of this, by the way, in conjunction with NECC, the Naval Expeditionary mm -hmm. Combat Command, Fleet Forces, uh, CNP, my partner in all of this. So uh, I'm not executing this in a vacuum. I mean, this is the Navy's approach to getting sailors where they need to be fast. I have to tell you, Austin, I'm a little struck with um, your, your earlier discussion about the age of the Navy Reserves and thinking yeah. through, thinking, doing things different. And you, what appears to be now the Navy Reserves questioning and answering how we used to do things to make it better. Yeah. Um, I had the opportunity to watch your, your Shark Tank. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where right. you, where you uh, brought people in and said, give me good ideas. And, right. and you know, right. no chain of command. I mean, their ideas came up through the chain, but, but they got to present to you right. directly. So as you think differently, and, and you know, there, there's a couple questions in, in the, from the audience here that deal specifically, a uh, little granular, right? right. That, that deal with specific areas. Um, and I'll, I'll, bring, I'll bring one up in, uh, specifically, but the question I guess I would ask is, how do you create a Navy Reserves 
that breaks through the barriers that you've known have existed yeah. for 30 years. Yeah. So Matt Previtz here asks, a uh, great deal of, of cross-aligned sailors throughout the reserve force. Um, with MOB to, to billet realignment, is there funding available to travel with supporting command more than once a quarter? Those kind of questions, Fantastic. I kind of believe you hear yeah. that a lot. How do you break through uh, to, to, to get the right person to the right place at the right time? You bet, awesome. Well, hey Matt, thanks for that great question. So, so first and foremost, every one of these tactical problems that we have endured, in some cases suffering in silence, really can be traced back to an institutional framework that doesn't support our needs. So one of the first things that changed my tenure from any of my predecessors was our getting the vice chief to establish 095 as a resource sponsor. So I control the budget now for the Navy Reserve. So that $3.7 billion per year, all of our discretionary reserve program Navy and Omen R, you know, that, that money now that right? allows me to move with much more dexterity and to be much more flexible in the association with analysis to execution. So, so that is a lever that is at my disposal that my predecessors didn't wield. And as a result, I'm moving a lot faster on a lot of things, not for lack of trying or interest from my predecessors, but, but I have better tools available now. Now, as it relates to Matt's question about cross assignment, I, let me correct it for the reserve force listening here. I would say, we, I, I don't allow my people to talk about cross assignment anymore. We have sailors and they are assigned. It doesn't matter where they live, they are assigned to a unit. If you live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, but your unit is in Norfolk, Virginia, then there are only a few reasons why you should be at the Reserve Center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Maybe it's medical, maybe it's a, a physical fitness assessment, maybe you're taking a Navy-wide exam, or you're doing your, um, uh, some GMT, you know, general military training. But for the most part, I don't want my selected Reserve sailors at the Reserve Center unless it is contributing to their mobilization readiness. Every other iota of energy in uniform should be spent qualifying in the mobilization billet. And that means working where the action is, which is at their supported command. So back to the specific question, is there, is there funding for more than once a quarter? The answer is absolutely. I have plussed up our IDTT. I know you don't know what that is, but folks listening will. Independent duty. <laughs> Close, but anyway, no. so the IDTT, RPN budget, okay. uh, and uh, ADT budget, I've plussed that up to account for monthly travel for sailors who are non-local. Okay, again, so Matt, help me out here. Stop talking about cross assigned. We got sailors who are assigned, doesn't matter where they live, just like would be the case if our nation goes to war and we need sailors to get where they are, where they're expected to be, where our taxpayers are paying for them to be. Let's get in the habit of practicing that. So every time we go to where the supporting command is, you're doing us a favor by getting the connections, the network. I wanna make sure your cat card loads at the desk that you're gonna to go to. I want you to know the person at the front desk so you can walk in and say, hi, Alice. You know, you need to be able to do what you're gonna do. And if we try to solve those problems after a catastrophic event, after the Chinese have invaded Taiwan, after Article 5 and NATO has been invoked, it's too late. We won't be able to figure it out. We got to do that stuff now. So, so anyway, I freed up the money yeah. specifically to address that. That sounds a lot, a lot like get real, get better. And you mentioned Absolutely. the vice chief, and yeah. um, and it does sound like that move, uh, where you're now a resource sponsor. Yeah. Um, you know, measure what what you want, tell what you tell. You know, give the give Absolutely. the answers. Um, yeah. Are you engaged in Get Real, Get Better? Oh, I gotta you believe better you're believe deeply it. immersed. I, I absolutely am, yeah. So, uh, so, so I'm one of 21 communities that are implementing this. So we're, we're attacking this uh, in a pretty systemic, thoughtful way. And I'm working with Jim Kilby very closely on this as well as the vice chief. But the intent is, okay, again, we've got about 60,000 folks. We are now in the midst, in FY23, our goal is to train every khaki sailor in the tenets of what Get Real, Get Better is all about. So, so there's certainly something to be said about exposure to the thought process, to the analytical rigor that goes into, you know, things like um, acting transparently. I mean, clearly we want to create an environment where our sailors are able to say, something's not working, you know? Mm -hmm. When we say embrace the red, it's you're not going to get your face shot off if you tell me something is not as good as it could be. My question is, thank you for sharing that. What can I do to make it so that it's better? So, so the short answer on GRGB, uh, the short mm -hmm. title for Get Real, Get Better, we are aggressively exposing our folks to it. There's a nomenclature, there is a philosophy, there's an approach. It's about analysis, it's about understanding root causes, it's about attacking the things that are most important. And 
and I embraced it before I'd heard of it. You know, these, yeah. these are all things that make so much sense to me that I'm very enthusiastic about it. And frankly, it boils down to Fortune 50 good business practices. And, and that's why I'm so into it and into the implementation because I don't want those things to originate from my office. I'd rather they originate from the sailors, from the deck plate, like we did with I3 Waypoints, as you described. Mm -hmm. and, and one other comment too, uh, it, uh, back to Women's History Month, something I'm very, very proud of is a result of a question that I got at an all hands call. And I just sent this petty officer an email this week because we just launched something called the in-service procurement program. This is the first time the Reserve Force has ever had a program that is a commissioning program for TAR enlisted to TAR officer. If you were a talented enlisted sailor and you wanted to be commissioned, before this year, you had to seek a commission in the active duty Navy and then petition to transfer later. So this came about because I had an E5 that said, sir, I'm interested in commissioning programs, but I'm a TAR sailor. It looks like I have to do this in the active Navy. Is anybody looking into this? And I said, wow, I wasn't even aware, but I'm looking into it. So I sent her a note to say, the NAV admin just went out and I want you to tell your boss and your peers that this happened because you asked that question. You know, so uh, we didn't call it get real, get better then, but, yeah. but it's another example. You know, we, we have good ideas at all levels and there's no monopoly on them in the 095 office at the Chief of Navy Reserve staff. So I wanna hear them, I wanna hear them from all levels because there's a lot we can do better, and oftentimes they're going to come from our young folks. Well, we're getting a lot of questions here, so my commitment to you is <laughs> I'm going to get you a copy of all these right questions because sure. I, I don't think I'm going to be able to get to all of them. Um, uh, and there's some some pretty good questions. Let me let me uh, some of them in here deal with with hardware, and I, I want to talk about uh, you know we do, we talk a lot about people with sure. the Navy Reserve because sure. it is it is about people. Um, do you have the hardware that you need? Do you have the, the, the resources you need uh, to do what you need to do, um, especially now as a resource sponsor? Um, I mean, 50,000 people in 30 days, I mean, it, you know, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, those numbers will be with me yeah. forever, but do you have the resources that you need to be able to do that? The answer is complicated. Uh, yeah. I, would, I would start by saying yes, but. And so when I talk about hardware, you know, I'm looking at our VR squadrons, C-130s and C-40s, our, uh, our adversary squadrons. You know, for the audience that doesn't know, we fly F-18, you know, Super Hornets, so Rhinos. Mm -hmm. We fly F-5s, we fly F-16s. We've got a VAQ squadron flying Growlers. You know, we've got an HSC squadron. We've got uh, an HSM squadron. Um, so, so we've got a lot of hardware. You know, I'm buying 93 40 foot patrol boats for NECC. We've got, currently we've got the 34 foot Sea Arc and we're transitioning now. You know, our cargo handling battalions, we're buying expeditionary VLS reload kits. So the answer is we've got hardware. I can always use more, but as a resource sponsor, like every other resource sponsor, every single dollar competes for the most urgent requirement. Mm -hmm. You know, if you ask the CNO, do you have what you need? He'd say, we need more ships, and, and we do, you know? Mm -hmm. And so my dollars compete with dollars that would go to ships. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't wanna be greedy, but I will take the opportunity to, to talk about my number one recapitalization priority. My C-130s, okay, so the Hercules airframes, mm -hmm. um, I mean, they are in every theater around the globe right now, and they are the most responsive uh, intra-theater lift uh, capability of any service. And that's a reserve only mission. There are no active duty C-130s. So, Anyway, mine on average are over three decades old, which means the mission capable rates are low, the pressure on the supply chain is challenging, Lockheed doesn't make them anymore because we've transitioned to C-130, KC-130 Juliet, I'm flying Tangos. Every other service that flies Hercs, active and reserve, has transitioned to Juliet's. I'm the only one flying Tangos. So, so we are in the process now, and CNO has identified this as a priority in his navigation plan, to recapitalize the Navy Reserve Herc fleet by 2030. So I need 32 of these by 2030, but they're not cheap. So, uh, so we're pursuing the first on my unfunded priority list, uh, or not my own, but the Navy's unfunded priority list to kickstart in FY24 the procurement of those new airplanes. But, but it's one of many examples. I mean, if you talk to any other resource sponsor, they would say, I need more destroyers. You know, I need, hey, what's yeah. the cruiser replacement? DDGX, what's that look like? So I'll make do. I mean, I always look at this and say, okay, does budget drive strategy or does strategy drive budget? If it was the former, 
That's kind of what I'm doing. We've got this much money, and I can tell you what we can generate with that. If we had more, if you want me to do this much, it costs more. And so we, we are very discriminating. You know, I mean, I can map that down to the dollar, and I can tell you if I had you know, X dollars, I can give you uh, Y additional readiness. Um, so, that, and that's not unique. That's the same yeah. nomenclature every resource sponsor uses. So it's building a business case. Absolutely. Which, which ties back uh, to your 2032 plan. Right. What, what does the Navy Reserve look like in, yeah. in 10 years, now yeah. nine years, at the end of your 2032 well, plan? Well, I, I tell you what, so thanks for asking that too, because it won't look like it does today. I would tell you right now, I, I agreed to buy 15,000 new computers for our, for our force because we had folks that were waiting 30 minutes every morning to reboot their computers because they were seven years old. You know, I mean, you know Moore's Law, I do too. Mm -hmm. uh, but I told my staff, I said, I do not want to get into this tail chase operation where we continue to just buy hardware. CPUs get old, there's not enough RAM, every software program gets bloated. You know, that's a fool's errand. I will baseline the force today in 2022 and 2023 in some cases, after which we are only buying applications and software. So SaaS based systems to allow us to have permeability in how we do what we do, where we do it. There's no reason that you need to go to a reserve center to sit on a computer if you could do it from your iPhone, your iPad, your Mac. I mean, already something called the Azure Virtual Desktop. I've got 6,500 of my sailors signed up on this Right now, no cost to sailors. I mean, uh, ultimately there will be a cost to me, but we're the pilot test for the Navy on this. You have your NMCI, lap, uh, your desktop on device of choice without a CAC reader, you know, fully offset compliant. So, so that's the future. When I start talking, when I think of what do we look like in nine years now, it's we're not tethered to a desk because there's an ethernet cable on a machine there. We're going to be a mobile, permeable, adaptive, flexible force that trains differently at either centers of excellence or on the road uh, at their time, uh, time and place of their choosing and can achieve certification and qualification with JQRs and PQSs and NOBCs, AQDs, NECs in a way that is, uh, that is digestible for a reserve force, a distributed force with families and civilian um, commitments. So that so uh, we're running out of time. I got to get to people. I got to get sure. to recruiting retention. Uh, yeah. Big in the news today across all the military, active Absolutely. and reserve. How's the, how's the Navy Reserve doing with recruiting and retention? We're not doing well, but we're getting after it. So I would tell you right now, we're about two thousand bodies short of our projected end strength. Okay, and every one of those billets is precious. You know, they're baked again into war plans and operational plans, concept of operations and employment. You know, we need the, we need our people. I view this as a two-sided equation. One is we need to be better at recruiting. And then simultaneously, we need to retain better. You know, for every sailor we retain, we need to recruit less. Um, unfortunately, this is a little bit of an error carried forward. We had several years where we didn't make goals, so we had an increasing deficit towards projected plan. Mm -hmm. We've done a number of things in the last year and a half that I'm very proud of. We stood up a recruiting reserve command. So I've got a TAR Commodore 06 who is laser focused purely on reserve recruiting. We haven't had that in over two decades. So we've got a whole team that now, and working with the recruiting, so uh, Admiral Lex Walker, before him, Dennis Velez, and CNP when it was John Now and now Rick Cheeseman, have, my, have been my partners in this because they recognize the importance. So, so we need to be really clever and, and think differently about how we attract the talent we're seeking. In my world, I want 80% of our affiliations to be prior service. So we're working upstream to get to sailors in fleet concentration areas who have identified that they are transitioning either to civilian employment or to the reserves. And, and I wanna make it clear to them that this is an employer of choice. In fact, CNO and I just cut a video that's being shown at every transition assistance program class, which is saying, shipmates, thanks for your, uh, for your service. Thanks for your family. I want you to meet my friend, John Muston you should consider serving in the reserve force. And I will tell them, if you wanna pursue uh, education, whether graduate or collegiate, do it. If you wanna start a family, if you wanna start a company, you know what? I did all of those things and continued to serve and you can too. And you will get retirement benefits and medical benefits and you can get uh, post 9-11 GI Bill benefits. Lots of reasons. The most important one being the camaraderie and the sense of service and the patriotism that comes with serving in the reserve force. So I was going to talk to you about that, about what you what you tell uh, folks, 80%. Uh, that's, that's a big number. Yeah. Um, and you've addressed that. 
I guess the I guess I would drill down a little deeper then and say, what do you wish people knew that they don't know about the yeah. Navy Reserves? Yeah. Well, first to clarify, so right now it's 60-40. I okay. would desire it to be 80. And the reason being, it's hard for me to send people to BUDS or flight school or sub school and you know, it's tough. In some, in some cases I can get them to, uh, to A schools to get an NEC, but, but if they walk off uh, of a former command with a warfare device, I can put them to work immediately. But, uh, but what do I want them to know? I, I want them to know that we have a sense of purpose. You know, this is not your grandfather's reserve force. You know, even my recollections, when I was an active duty sailor you know, 20 years ago, I used to think, oh yeah, reserves, that's the coffee and donut stuff, right? You know, you show up at a reserve center in the middle of nowhere and nobody knows or cares, right? That is not the world we're living in now. I am making fleet circulations and I'm talking directly to our four-star fleet commanders about what they need from the reserves and we're building it. That's the design the force. We're training to it. That's our train the force. We're ready to send people there, mobilize the force, and we're developing our people to make sure that those who want to be a part of this elite warfighting team you know, you, you, this isn't like a baby bird thing where you come in and say, I'm a consumer of culture. You know, everyone who joins this team needs to contribute to the culture. You know, I only want folks who are ready to come in and be a part of it and add to it. You know, you can't just consume. You know, I want folks who make it better every day. So, so anyway, there's a lot that we're doing right. And I think uh, I wish everyone knew it. So there's probably a bunch of reservists watching here today. Uh, what's your message to the, to the reservists who are, who are out there? Well, I hope they've heard it all before because I spent a lot of time trying to make sure that I'm communicating to them. But the number one message is keep up the great work, gang. We are doing phenomenal work. I mean, I talked to the CNO, I talked to the Secretary of the Navy. Again, our four-star fleet commanders, our numbered fleet commanders, type commanders, syscoms. I talked to them all and the message is always the same. I couldn't do what I do without your folks. So I am really proud of, of everyone's contribution and what they're doing. I mean, every day, I mean, I'm real, I meet someone every day that makes, that blows me away with how talented they are. The flip side is we are in the midst of a transformation and we are far from done. So let's not rest on our laurels and, and let's not uh, break our arms, patting ourselves on the back here. We got a lot to do and I'm proud of the pace uh, that we're getting after it, but we're far from done. So, so we got a long way to go, but keep up the good work. So Admiral Mustin, when, um, when I invited you to come on to this, um, I promised you we'd be on an hour because I, I said, because I know you're busy. I'm even more convinced of that now because I don't know about everybody's watching, but I'm exhausted just, you know, hearing what you're, you've got going on. So, um, so I promise we'd get you out of here in an hour and uh, so that we'll run out of time. Anything you'd like to add before, uh, before we wrap up? Just one thing. So to add a finer point to your very first comment, I, I remember like it was yesterday, it was Ensign Mustin and <laughs> Lieutenant Commander Thorpe. And, and to this day, I tell everybody that uh, you taught me everything that I know, but only a little of what you know. Well, uh, well you're very kind. And uh, I would just remind you, you're a three star. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and seriously, congratulations on a, uh, just a, you know, having known you and, and uh, watch what you've done through the years, I mean, uh, you know, you, you mentioned the stereotype uh, reserves and, and you, you and your leadership and the rest of the reserves out there are just doing incredible things. Um, you know, back before you were commissioned, I remember in 89 when uh, the reserves were called upon and the, we've come so far uh, in the time that, that since I've been involved yeah. with the Navy, what the reserves are contributing. So, yeah. uh, so thank you. you thank bet. you. Well, there's more to come. So, yeah. All right. So thank you very much for, uh, for joining us uh, for the sit rep. We've got a, a lot of good events coming up. Uh, matter of fact, we have Mick Ponhoney coming on to the sit rep uh, in two weeks. He'll be here on March 14th. That invitation, uh, you should see that tomorrow. Uh, and I got to tell you, at springtime, uh, we're starting to think about springtime here in Washington. Uh, we're going to start doing uh, uh, movies on the memorial here in spring due to popular demand to move it forward. We're going to do April 6th, uh, South Pacific for all you old movie fans. And then uh, on April 13th, we're going to do Top Gun Maverick, uh, the brand new uh, Top Gun movie. We're going to show it out on the plaza. Uh, so we're expecting a good crowd for that. And then the Blessing of the Fleet on April 15th. So uh, a lot going on here at the Navy Memorial. Admiral Mustin, really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you for taking your time to be here on, uh, on sit -Rack. Great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. And all of you, we wish you fair winds and following seas.